which is nothing but any liquid coming out of your ear canal is called as ear discharge. So wax, when it is produced, it is transparent liquid. As it is exposed to the air, it becomes opaque, whitish, and then into yellowish color, brown, black. Many times it comes like wet ear discharge from the canals, and sometimes it would be like whitish uh, flakes coming out of the extranotic canal. So people should not get scared when they find an ear discharge without any other symptom. Now, if we keep the ear wax aside, now comes the real uh, ear discharges. So what are the different types of ear discharges? Commonest would be pus. They can be pus, they can be mucus discharge, or they can be pus mixed with mucus, which we call as mucopurulent discharge. They can be discharge of clear liquid, which we call as serous discharge. They can be blood coming out, which we call as bloody discharge, or there can be a mixture of serous fluid and blood, which is called as serosanguinous discharge in clinical terms. So these are the different kinds of air discharges that we commonly find. But the most important thing for us to know to treat a patient or to deal with a patient of air discharge is the location from where it is coming from. So when we look at the ear anatomically, it is divided into external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. So ear discharge can come from any one of these locations. So external ear contains of your ear, which we call a spina, outer ear, and then it leads to an opening called as introitus of the external auditory canal. So starting from introitus, if you find ear discharge, a little wetness only on the introitus, that means only on the opening of the external auditory canal, then you should know if it is not earwax, the only thing that can affect this part of the ear is a fungal skin lesion. Many times people keep on scratching when they get ear wax, they keep scratching, which leads to uh, fungal infections in that location. And patient can present with just wetness on the introitus only and the canal and the eardrum, they will be fine. In that case, better for us to take a swab and send it for fungal strain and fungal culture. Based on that, we can initiate antifungal medication. And also we can give some antifungal creams to apply. Now, if the ear discharge is coming from the external auditory canal, there is only one possibility. It has to be pus. Why? Because mucus discharge cannot come from the external auditory canal. Mucus glands are present only in the middle ear. They are not present in the skin of the external auditory canal. So mucus discharge cannot arise from external canal. So if you find frank pus, most often if it is presenting with ear pain, it will be from external canal. So if it is an infection, if it, if it is an, if it is a bacterial infection, it is called as otitis externa, which is nothing but inflammation of the skin of the external canal. So what causes the inflammation of the skin of the external canal? It can be because of people with thin fingers putting inside and uh, trying to uh, scratch, or else it can be because of you using some cotton bud or anything inside your ear can also scratch. Some people, after taking a shower or after having a swim in the pool, they would try to clean the ear canals using cotton buds. So these cotton buds can cause inflammation of the external artery canal skin which is called as otitis externa. In some situations, some allergic situations like eczema, there also they will be having itching, which will be presenting um, with 
intense itching, which people, people will, uh, because of which people will put in cotton buds inside and they will do, they will scratch, which leads to inflammation. This inflammation gets secondary bacterial infection, which is called as otitis externa again. There is, other, there is another case in which the skin can present with a blab, serious pain, as well as furulent discharge, which is called as furuncle. Furuncle is nothing but infection of the hair follicles inside your external artery canal. The ear canal, if we divide it into three parts, the outer one third is the place where hair follicles are present, sebaceous gland surface are present, and sedimentous glands, which are wax producing glands, are present. The inner two thirds has nothing like that, and it is sterile. So, outer one thirds will have hair follicles. And if you put in your finger, or like I said, cotton bud, or hair pin, or something, you might actually damage one of the follicles of the hair, follicles of the hair inside the outer one third of the external canal, which can lead to formation of an abscess in the follicle of the hair in the external canal. So this is very intense in terms of pain. So how do you know if the pain is coming uh, from the external canal or from some other reason? So as far, as far as the bacterial infection is concerned, it is called as otitis externa. But if it is an infection because of fungus, it is called automycosis in which case the discharge will not be as copious as uh, otitis externa, but there will be um, cheesy discharge present inside the external canal, which can come out also uh, because of fungus. Now, how to differentiate these conditions like furuncal, otitis externa, and uh, your fungal infection of the external canal called automycosis. So when you look at the ear, you have a little projection here. This is called tragus. This tragus, when we press on it, when the patient having ear discharge, if we press on it and the patient complains of pain, this is called tenderness, otherwise called as tragal tenderness. When patients complain that, you know for sure that it is because of otitis external. There is another projection right opposite to the tragus. It is called antitragus, and and the groove in between below is called intertragal sulcus. Now, if you press on the intertragal sulcus, if the patient complains of a dull ache, you know that it is because of automycosis or fungal infection of the external auditory canal. And if the patient, if you try to just move the pinna like this and the patient complains of severe pain, most often it would be because of a furuncle in the external canal. In some cases, especially in children, the infection of the middle ear because of viral common cold, which is otherwise called acute otitis media. In some cases, uh, children can also complain of pain when the pinna is pulled out like this, but this is not very common. So, Simply by pressing the tragus and the intertragal sulcus and pulling the pinna, you can identify otitis externa or furuncle or automycosis. <clears throat> so there can be some situations where patient will present with otitis externa, means there is pus in the ear canal, which will be infected again, I mean like superimposing infection with fungus, especially aspergillus. So when you look at it, you see pus. On top of that, you'll be seeing uh, black heads, which are otherwise called the, which are otherwise spores of aspergillus fungus. So that is the reason why most often ENT surgeons, when they find patient with otitis externa or automycosis, the drops would be similar. They'll be giving a combination of antibiotics, antifungus, as well as anesthetic, which are drops, which will help relieve all of the conditions at the same time. Now, what happens if the ear discharge is coming from the tympanic membrane? 
Can an intact tympanic membrane produce air discharge? Absolutely, it is possible. Air canal will be intact and healthy, but the tympanic membrane will be damaged because some people will be putting their cotton buds deep inside the air canals and they will be eroding the superficial skin surface of the eardrum, which leads to healing by secondary intention, causing granulations to form. These granulations will be enlarged and they can become even polyps in the extra trigonal arising from the tympanic membrane. So these granulations on the tympanic membrane, which are because of erosions caused by the person himself, that can produce some air discharge, which is very much purulent. So apart from that, you can also find bleeding coming out of an intact tympanic membrane in cases of viral infections called myringitis bullosa or hemorrhagic bullous myringitis. So in these cases, there will be blebs on the inside the skin on the tympanic membrane and they can bleed. You see, so not ear discharges are one and the same. So apart from this, can there be any other ear discharge coming from the external canal? There is one case where the bone behind the ear called as mastoid, if that is infected and that is filled with pus, that pus has to come out somehow. So if that cannot perforate the eardrum, it many times will cause erosion of the bone of the external canal and it will come underneath the skin of the external canal, which we call a sagging of posterior superior skin of the external canal. And many times, without, while still the tympanic membrane being intact, it can actually, uh, the discharge, the pus can make its way into the external canal through the wall of the external canal and it comes out. You see, now we are coming to the eardrum perforation. So many times perforations are because of infection in the nose which leads to blockage of eustachian tube and collection of fluid behind the eardrum and then fluid turning into pus and making a way out through a hole, making a hole in the eardrum and it comes out. But other times, tympanic membrane can be injured by a slap on your ear or by a simple kiss on the ear. Because if, if you kiss on the ear, what happens is there'll be negative pressure developing inside the canal and the eardrum tears off. So the same happens with slap injury where the pressure will be positive pressure, not a negative pressure. So these are the causes uh, for perforation of the eardrum many times. So once the middle layer is infected and there is a hole in the external canal, then ear discharge will come out. But holes are of two types as far as the tympanic membrane is concerned because the eardrum has two parts, superior part and inferior part. Superior part is a little uh, relaxed and the inferior part is tense. Okay, So that's the reason why we call it part, superior part, the upper part we call it pars placida and lower, bar, lower part pars tensa. Now the perforation, if it is in the lower part, it is called a central perforation and the perforation, if it is in the upper part, is, it is called as attic perforation. Now, why I told you about these perforations is because if the discharge is coming from the central perforation, that means perforation in the lower part of the tympanic membrane, it will be copious because of the mucus glands which are producing in the middle ear. But if the discharge is coming from a small hole in the upper part of the tympanic membrane, which is called pars placida. These perforations we call as attic perforations. If that discharge is coming from there, it will be very scanty. Why? Because pars placida perforations are most often caused by retraction, retraction of the tympanic membrane in the upper part, and then collection of this dead skin inside that sac of sac which is actually opening out as a perforation. And this dead skin emanates little bit of 
purulent discharge. At the same time, it, it emanates a lot of um, foul odor. So by simply um, smelling the ear discharge, you can tell whether it is coming from the inferior part, lower part of the eardrum or the upper part of the eardrum, as well as the quantity of air discharge. The quantity will be less, very less when it is from the upper part and it is copious much when it is coming from the lower part. So before we talk about the middle ear, the eardrum. When the eardrum is perforated, the kind of discharge that is expected is frank blood. So a patient might present to you and say, I've got an injury on the ear and now I'm seeing frank blood coming out. So many times it would be nothing but a simple torn eardrum. And many times these torn eardrums, you don't need to do anything at all. You just need to wait and watch. Within two months, they heal pretty well unless and until the ear perforation is pretty large. If you have a perforation in the canal because of an injury, never instill ear drops in it. Why? Because their eardrum has three layers. Outer one is skin, inner one is mucosa, and the middle one is a fibrous layer. So these, if you instill ear drops, what will happen? The freshness of the eardrum perforation will be lost and the skin can get united with the mucosa on the inside, which prevents the perforation from healing. So never instill drops in a patient who is complaining of a fresh perforation, either because of injury or because of acute separative otitismia. Okay, now, the discharge, when it is coming from middle ear, like I said, it has to be mucoid. How do you know it is mucoid? How do you differentiate a mucoid discharge from a serous discharge? Simple. If it is serous discharge, it will be thin like water. If it is a mucoid discharge or mucus that is coming out, simply it will stretch if you try to pull it out. Okay? So, if the discharge is coming from the middle ear only, many times it will be mucus discharge. But if there are granulations in the middle ear because of injury or because of repeated infections, there'll be mucopurulent discharge, combination of mucus and pus. But many times, if the purulent part is dominant and mucoid part is less, it'll be from the mastoid, that means mastoiditis. So how to differentiate if there is an active mastoiditis which is pouring out this ear discharge? Typically in mastoiditis, most commonly in acute cases, but sometimes in chronic cases also, whenever the discharge is coming from the mastoid, there will be a sign called lighthouse sign. Lighthouse sign is nothing but ear discharge coming out in pulsations. Like when you put in your endoscope or your otoscope or your torchlight inside the ear canal, when you look at it, the light will be reflected by the eardrum, generally the anterior inferior part of the eardrum, because of the pull of the uh, umbo of the malleus on the eardrum. But when there is a perforation, this is lost. You can find ear discharge, and the ear discharge will be the reflection of the light will be coming from the ear discharge. When you throw your light on it, the, the light will be pulsating because the discharge itself is coming out in pulsations. So whenever there is a pulsation, you should know it is coming from the mastoid. In some situations where there, there is a dehiscence, dehiscent roof of the jugular bulb below or the internal carotid artery um, has a dehiscence on, uh, on its roof, it can lead to transmitted pulsations, but the discharge will not be copious. Okay, so that's how you can know where the discharge is coming from. So in some situations, discharge will not be from mastoid, discharge will not be from middle ear, but it can be from petrous pyramid because there are intrapetrous cells which might get infected. Sometimes there will be osteomyelitis of Petrous bone because of obstruction of the cells, 
as well as presence of some granulation or cholesterol in the petrous bone. This can lead to uh, formation of pus and this also can come out as discharge. So you see all of these different kinds of air discharges we commonly see, but there are some cases when there is an injury of the temporal bone, like an injury come hitting from the side or hitting from the back, it can fracture the temp uh, <clears throat> temporal bone, which can lead to leakage of cerebrospinal fluid from the brain into the ear. So if there is a perforation also on the eardrum, the CSF will come out as clear liquid. It will be like serous fluid. If the, if the injury is fresh, it can get mixed with blood and you will find uh, serosanguinous discharge. So how do, you, how do you know, how do you identify the presence of CSF in the ear discharge? Again, like what you do in case of CSF leak in the nose, you can do a halo test where you take a tissue paper and put in a little bit of discharge on top of that and you will find formation of a halo around a blood spot. That, that way you can tell that there is CSF mixed with blood. And other way to identify CSF that is coming from the ear canal is to subject it to a lab test to see how much of beta transference present because beta transference is uh, specific to CSF. So that way you can identify it. So not all cases can be handled by, an, uh, by a general physician or an ordinary person. Um, but most of the times, if you understand what I'm talking about, if you have a little bit of knowledge about the anatomy of the ear, you'll be able to identify the location and you'll be able to guide your treatment in, the, in a targeted way. But if you have any doubt, you can go for other tests. You can take an opinion of an ENT surgeon near you or myself if you are close by. We can really uh, help you to, <clears throat> to get yourself treated completely from these disorders. So there is much more to talk about, but I think it's already 20 minutes past. So now I would like to take some questions if there is anything from your side. We wind up. OK, so <clears throat> if you have any if you have any questions regarding what I've just uh, discussed, you can comment in the comment section and when I can see it, I will reply you back. OK, thank you for your time. Again, I'm Dr. Pradeep Palakunda, ENT head and neck surgeon from Apollo Hospitals, Vishakhapatnam, working in Health City Unit. Thank you for your time. Bye.